morning to one and all present here. Uh, this uh, talk is going to be on approach to neurogenic bladder. It was once a debate on which is the best organ, heart or bladder. The heart argued, I'm crucial for life and without me, you will sink. The bladder said, I'm crucial for quality of life and without me, you will stink. And uh, heart said, I'm the most sought after transplant Whereas the bladder said, I'm unique, I'm hard to transplant. So the judge ruled eventually in favor of bladder. He said, heart is the most selfish organ. It feeds itself first. And heart is also an outlaw. It can function itself outside the body without nerves. And uh, guess what? The judge was a neurologist who was a three quarters neurologist. And he's also a friend. So coming to the old terminology, a neurosis referred to inappropriate or involuntary discharge of urine past the age of usual control, which is considered to be developmental age of five to seven. So that is a conventional old definition. For example, in this uh, two and a half year old boy, if he pees on his dad, then are going to get upset or you know get cross with the baby. They would simply, uh, happily record the moment in their minds. On the other hand, incontinence refers to involuntary loss of urine beyond the age of expected control. It also refers to constant soiling caused by pathological inability to control. In 2016, the International Children Continent Society changed the terminology. They said all incontinence are equal to leak and only the term incontinence is used. Incontinence is uh, referred to as continuous or intermittent. And intermittent incontinence can be divided into daytime or nighttime, and which is called a neurosis. So this is funny because the older term of diurnal neurosis or poor bladder control is not at all considered in this terminology. Development of bladder control uh, starts with a very high number of voiding per day during infancy around 20 times per day in the first year of life, and then 11 per day in the second year, and around, uh, it becomes normal like five to six times a day from seventh year onwards. So voluntary control of voiding during the day is achieved first by girls around 200 or three years, and followed by boys in two and three quarter years. And up to four years, this process may continue, and the control pattern is like this, nighttime bladder control, followed by daytime bowel control, followed by daytime bladder control, followed by nighttime bladder control. Avoiding during infancy is a reflux act. Uh, cortical inhibition is poorly developed. Uh, so the critical cortical input for inhibiting uh, at an inappropriate time is not there. However, avoiding is rare during the sleep and the child invariably wakes up during the avoiding. The storage is at a low pressure but the voiding is at high pressure because the coordination between a bladder and sphincter is absent, leading to some amount of dyssynergia. Let's talk a little bit about bladder innovation. Um, the bladder is a muscular organ, and um, it's made of an important muscle called the drusa and the internal sphincter, both of which are um, smooth muscles, and then external sphincter, which is a striated muscle. Now, sympathetics. Um, and the parasympathetic supply both the drusa and the internal sphincter. And sympathetics from T11 to L1 are responsible for uh, storage or prevention of voiding, whereas parasympathetic are responsible for voiding or emptying of the bladder. Now, pudendal nerve or somatic nerves are responsible for controlling the external sphincter. In addition, there is a cerebral cortex which decides whether it is an appropriate time and then um, decides whether to allow or not allow the voiding. Cerebellum, uh, as usual, is responsible for coordination of um, sphincter, internal and external, along with the detrusa. And if cerebellar problems are there, the external sphincter uh, doesn't uh, relax during voiding, leading to detrusa sphincter dyssynergia. Now, pontian micturition center is uh, an important center which decides when to void. So the cerebral cortex eventually uh, sends the signal to pontine maturation center, 
and this ha this switch has to be on along with a switch at the sacral maturation center. So this is a bit like a staircase switch or a two-way switch where both the sacral switch and the pontine switch have to be on. Invariably, the sacral switch is always on and the pontine switch, uh, whether it to switch it on or off, is decided by the cerebral cortex. Now, bladder has got two functions, filling and voiding. The filling should be at a low pressure with the detrusa relaxed. It should be up to adequate volume and there should be no leak, which means the sphincter is closed. And the voiding has to be at adequate pressure, the detrusa should contract to empty the bladder and they should void to completion with no post void residual volume and they should void in a single stream, which means there is no sphincter contraction during voiding. And as I said earlier, the pontine maturation center should be switched on for contraction of the trusser and inhibition of bladder outlet. So this invariably leads a parasympathetic system and the pontine storage center uh, is responsible uh, for storing the bladder or preventing bladder contraction. Now, when you look at the etiology of neurogenic bladder, if you want to divide them into two groups, based on upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. And that is the cutoff, S2, S3, S4, where the, the reflux happens. So any lesions above that, like a cerebral palsy, transverse myelitis, stroke, spinal tumor, and some cases of tethered cord, you can actually call them upper motor neuron lesions. And um, lesions uh, which involve the pelvic splanchnic nerves in the form of a pelvic surgery, sacrococcygeal teratoma, and pelvic tumors are uh, accounting for the lower motor neuron lesions. Now, now myelomeningocele, lipomeningocele, and sacralagenesis actually lead to a combination of upper and lower motor neuron lesions, and these uh, can be um, a problem where both um, hyperreflexia and areflexia can be there. Now, old terminology is obsolete. Um, the, the usual terminology, what we learned during the college days, or atonic bladder, where um, the, it, is, uh, it is called, uh, um, it occurs during spinal shock, uh, during early stage of a, a spinal cord trauma, where the bladder has got no afferent or afferent, it just fills and uh, it empties by an overflow emptying. Automatic bladder is where the spinal cord issues are there, but they present late where um, there is a recovery after spinal injury, but the bladder um, doesn't have any cortical inhibition. So it fills and empties as per the, um, the sacral control. So there may be multiple uh, voidings like 20 to 30 times as in a child, but still it may be a low pressure voiding uh, as in a child. Autonomous bladder on the other hand is where um, the, the detrusor center disenergies there and the bladder tries to overcome that. So the bladder takes over and becomes a high pressure bladder. So these terminologies are gone these days. And uh, we now have a classification into the drusa and sphincter, overactive and underactive, a combination of those. So we have four combinations, an overactive bladder and overactive sphincter, which is like a hissing pressure cooker, a high risk problem for renal dam damage. And there is an underactive bladder and overactive sphincter, it's a bit like an overflowing bucket with no outlet. And the overactive bladder and the underactive sphincter, it's a bit like an open process cooker. And the underactive bladder and underactive sphincter, that's like a leaking bucket. Now, history taking is crucial in um, patients with the incontinence. So we need to find out whether wetting is a problem during the day only or both the day and night. So is wetting new or has it been present since childhood? And is it continuous? or intermittent. Are there normal voiding episodes uh, during, uh, in between the waiting episodes? Are there any preventive body posturing in the form of leg crossing, squatting, which is known, also known as Vincent's curtsy? Are there features of bladder instability like urgency, frequency, and urgent continence? The definition of frequency is more than eight voids per day. And urgency is uh, inability to control when they can, and uh, urgent continence is where they leak. So these are typical holding maneuvers, crossing of the legs, pinching of the perineum or penis, and uh, crouching with the heels pressing on the perineum. Um, they are trying to overcome the bladder contraction by putting pressure on the perineum. 
So we need to know these things because we need to know the differential diagnosis between functional neuropathic and structural causes. Uh, functional cause is where there is no organic problem or neurological problem, uh, but it's basically the, the bladder function, the bladder control. So typically it's an aneurysis or bedwetting or one of those, uh, which is a urge uh, syndrome. So those things are, can be nocturnal or diurnal, very rarely they are both. On the other hand, neuropathic problems are both nocturnal and diurnal, and the structural problems also are present since childhood, like ectopic ureter or epispadias. These are all incontinent right from childhood. So history gives a clue, and uh, pure nighttime voiding um, is nocturnal aneurysis, has been dry before. It's very unlikely to be having an organic cause. In neurogenic cause, the symptoms are present uh, almost uh, since birth, and they are both the day and night, except in one condition where there is a tethered cord. Where at birth, they are okay, but as the child develops, the tethered cord causes symptoms around some sixth or seventh year of life. Now, continuous wetting or chronic causes like epispadias and ectopic ureter or urogenital sinus can be there. Intermittent daytime wetting can be functional, and associated bowel problems uh, should give a clue to presence of either neurogenic or dysfunctional voiding. So it actually doesn't help because bowel problems are very common in children with incontinence. But in neurogenic bladder, it's very important to get an idea about the extent of uh, constipation. So wetting soon after the voiding uh, can be because of vaginal reflux, a simple change of the posture and then opening the legs uh, during voiding can help them to defeat this particular problem. Libel syneche, uh, when you examine, you can find this problem and uh, the urine pooling there can lead to post war dribbling um, or sometimes urine infections also. And simple separation of labial additions under local or general anesthesia is all that is needed. So you need to be aware of the uh, differential diagnosis of all these problems. So a clinical examination should include uh, examining the abdomen for palpable bladder as in a case of an obstructive uropathy, then expressible bladder as in a case of an uropathy. Now, expressible bladder is a unique problem. It is there only in neurogenic bladder. In a normal child, whatever amount of pressure you put on the abdomen, you will not be able to overcome the sphincter resistance. Uh, whereas in a patient with a neurogenic bladder, you can express the bladder. And uh, sometimes this is called a Creed's maneuver to empty the bladder, which is a poor way of emptying the bladder. Now, fecal loading, you have to examine for that. Then genitalia has to be examined for uh, associated structural problems. As I said, the spine has to be examined for hairy patch, swelling, sinus, and then presence of a normal sacrum, and a scar of a previous surgery. The neurology, examine the gait for lower limb wasting, refluxes. And uh, so that is a typical epispadias. In a male child, it's very easy. In a female child, you have to look carefully for the bifid clitoris. So here, you can see a tuft of hair as a sign of a spinal bifida, a cult child in the first image. The second image is a case of a lipomeningocele which has been operated. And the third image is that of a sacrococcygeal teratoma that has been operated, having a scar over the sacrococcygeal region. Now, as an important point about sacral agenesis, if you look at the picture on the top, you can see the normal gluteal anatomy. So the gluteal cleft is quite deep and long, and the gluteal folds are very prominent on either side of the cleft. Whereas in those with the sacral agenesis, typically in the pictures below, um, the gluteal cleft is very short. It is not there all the way up. And the, um, the gluteal folds are absent or very poorly formed, leading to a flat sacrum. And when X-ray clinches the diagnosis, it can be partial uh, or total sacral agenesis. And the posteriorly placed anal opening is an associated finding in those with the sacral agenesis. Now coming to sacral dimples and skin markers, uh, neonatologists are often getting uh, worried about this uh, when the parents ask, this is this a dimple there, should we evaluate further? The top three images are basically uh, normal variants, uh, a little bit of tuft of hair there, or a small dimple close to the anal verge, or when you open the dimple, and it is totally covered with the skin, and you can see up to the bottom of the dimple. So these are all normal variants they probably do not need evaluation. 
On the other hand, the ones in the bottom row are all uh, more sinister ones. There's a skin tag there. Here there is a deep pit and you can't see the bottom of it. Here it is a quite large and wide one with some skin discoloration. And here there is a hemangioma on the top of a uh, sacral dimple. So the red flag signs are multiple dimples, dimple diameter larger than five millimeter, location uh, two and a half centimeters above the anal verge, and association of the dimple with other cutaneous markers. So these uh, patients can undergo ultrasound spine. Typically, ultrasound spine is useful in those less than three months of age, where you can still image the uh, intraspinal anatomy, looking for uh, lipoma or the kind of phylum terminal, all those things. And in 95% of them, and they are normal. If they are um, any having any suspicion, then you can go for an MRI scan. Now, when to suspect neuropathy, I keep on repeating this uh, slide again. So several inc severe incontinence day and night, bowel problems, expressible bladder, gait abnormality, the neurological signs involving S2 to 4, like ankle reflex, anal tone, bulbo cavernous reflex, trophic ulcers, lower limb wasting, and uh, talipes. So all those things should make one suspect uh, neurological signs. A spine may have occult or overt features, and ultrasound shows often bilateral hydroic nephrosis with a thickened bladder and post wireless L volume. An MCU will show an abnormal bladder shape, an X-ray and an MRI spine are the next investigations. So the neural tube defect can be a spina bifida occulta, as you see here, or um, a spina bifida cystica, which can be a lipomeningocele or myelomeningocele, or can be an open neural spool uh, tube defect. Now, a word about tethered card syndrome. In the fetal life, conus ends at L2, and this ascends up to T12 at the puberty. The thick phylum uh, can lead to tethering of the uh, spinal cord or a post uh, lipomeningocele surgery, um, there can be tethering because of scarring and these can prevent the ascent of the spinal cord and then invariably lead to traction as well as ischemic insult to the, uh, the corners. Uh, so they often present late, with the trophic ulcers, limb weakness or dribbling and urinary symptoms are very early to present. Prompt detethering reverses neurological impairment in these children. And the bladder problems are invariably mild and majority can be managed conservatively. And neurodynamic patterns change post detethering. So I generally wait for the detethering to be completed before starting evaluation with an MCU or a neurodynamic study patients. Now previous pelvic surgery, anorectal malformation, Hirschsprung's pull through. So all these can interfere with the um, the innervation to the blood of the sacral splanchnic nerves. So typically these are all lower maternal on lesions leading to sphincter weakness. Um, now one thing which you have to note is that in the in the in those the typical upper motor neuron lesions, uh, you have increased blood or tone um, and this detrusor sphincter dysenergia, which means contracting sphincter. Whereas in those with the lower motor neuron lesion, you may still have a larger capacity bladder, but you will have a weak sphincter causing incontinence. So incontinence due to sphincter incompetence. Uh, but as I said, myelomeningocele causes both. Now, um, patients with uh, imperforate NS may have associated uh, sacral agenesis or underlying spina bifida, and they may have associated a constipation, which can compound the problem. So the investigations in these patients are routine urine culture, ultrasonogram to look for upper tract dilatation, bladder wall thickening, residual volume, X-ray abdomen for fecal loading, MRI, VCUG, ultrasound, uh, GTP, urodynamic study, and a DMSA scan to look for renal scars. So MCU um, can be normal if the bladder contour is absolutely good. It, it, if the urethra is normal, and the, you, I have put a normal MCU here of a non neurological patient just for you to understand that how this should look like normal urethral stream, blood neck is good, and there is a, a good contour of the blood. On the other hand, in a neurogenic bladder, you have the Christmas tree appearance, there is trabaculation and saculation all the way around, 
and the bladder often tilts to the right side towards one side it expands to the one side and elongates to the one side causing a pubertary appearance now presence of um, external sphincter dysgenesia causes a false appearance of a posterior urethral valve it's not a valve they just dilated a posterior urethra due to external sphincter dysgenesia now principles of urodynamics is basically you leave a rectal catheter to measure the abdominal pressure and the vesicle catheter to measure the bladder pressure and there is a um, saline uh, infusing line so that is again going to the bladder so the bladder actually can have a double human line one to infuse and one to measure the pressure now when we subtract the abdominal pressure from uh, bladder pressure from the abdominal pressure we get the detrusor pressure so that is the equation so p det equal to p vesicle minus p abdomen so we measure the bladder pressure abdominal pressure then when we minus them we get a detrusor pressure so getting the child required can be a challenge in the past but nowadays with the presence of our cell phones it has become absolutely easy to have all these children um, lie down quietly with some games and stuff so that is the urodynamics being performed so you see the vesicle line there message machine vesicle pressure and then the abdominal line measuring the abdominal pressure and when you subtract these two you get a detrusor pressure and the starting pressures are usually um, uh, below 2 because you have a good subtraction and here we are filling at a low fill 10 ml per minute and as we start filling initial pressures are as i said is only 1 or 2 there is a good subtraction and as you keep filling you have to watch for increase in pressure now generally the pressures remain low less than 10 through the entire fill and if there is an increase in pressure then you probably will know that there is either an unstable contraction or also known as neuro, uh, neurogenic detrusor overactivity and then if the pressure keeps on going up you know that there is a uh, poor compliance so that is a urodynamic in a patient with uh, increasing pressures if you do it under contrast uh, screening you can know that um, that that there is a reflux during the study the reason why we need to know it is because um, when the pressure goes up and comes down you need to know whether it came down because of the reflux into the kidneys so in this patient there was a starting of reflux with an increasing pressure the pressure has now gone up to 40 and uh, once uh, it goes up we can see that there is a reflux happening into the kidneys during screening and that leads to reduction in the pressure so that is a, a detrusor overactive contraction or neurogenic detrusor overactivity so what you see is the contraction wave there the pressure increases and the patient either leaks or refluxes and uh, this is a reflux going all the way up to the kidneys and uh, this patient has got um, a vd urodynamic study which is useful so as i said in a normal urodynamic study the filling pressures are usually less than 10 Uh, when it goes above 15 you can call it an overactive bladder or detrusor overactivity neurogenic detrusor overactivity or unstable contraction when the patient leaks you call that pressure as detrusor leak leak point pressure and it, if it is more than 40 it is unsafe for the kidneys now warding pressures are usually about 80 cc and if it is not generating enough pressure again that is also abnormal so in a urodynamic study you note the bladder capacity bladder compliance which is basically delta v by delta p so as i said if you fill up to 300 ml with less than 10 ml increase in pressure then you got a 30 compliance which is normal whereas if the pressure goes up uh, within 100 ml then you got a poor compliance which is uh, less than 10 so bladder sensation then presence of neurogenic detrusor overactivity leak point pressure post ward residual volume all these things you should measure so this is a patient with a 15 year old boy post myelomeningocele and these are all unstable contractions or neurogenic detrusor activity in addition the slope of the curve if you see is going up really fast so that slope of the curve is me- measured by the delta v by delta p also known as non compliance or poor compliance now this is a two different patient this is a 12 year old boy with a normal uh, voiding face And this is a 22 year old patient with cerebral palsy who have been following since childhood now here if you can see during the voiding this is the urine flow there and this is the detrusor pressure is going up 
uh, vesicle pressure and detrusor pressure is going up, but the abdominal pressure is not going up. That is stable. So the, the detrusor is contracting and there is a urine flow. Whereas in this patient, if you see, the patient is using the abdominal straining, the past urine, and uh, there is a very poor flow there. So it is a patient who is not able to generate a good amount of the that pressure. So when you look at the incidence of neurogenic bladder, myelomeningocele and lipomeningocele are the top causes of neurogenic bladder. The incidence is as high as 70 to 90% in them. In sacral agenesis, it is slightly less, around 60 to 70%. In tether record, it is 40 to 50%. And in cerebral palsy and anorectal malformation, uh, the incidence of neurogenic bladder is in a third of patients. So the principles of treatment of neurogenic bladder, the primary aim is to safeguard the renal function, minimize the risk of urinary tract infections, ensure that the urine is stored at low pressures, and the bladder empties completely every three to four hours. The secondary aim is to make them socially acceptable in terms of urinary continence. So the steps to promote safe storage, the step one is to increasing dose of active cold urgics to relax the bladder, Till adverse symptoms are manifested. Step two is to add a second anticholinergic agent or trying bladder insulation of uh, anticholinergic if there are side effects. Step three is to give a botulinum toxin in those who are refractory to anticholinergics. And step four is to go for augmentation cystoplasty, uh, which is the only remedy if the Botox also fails. Now, pharmacotherapy, I am not going to the full details of pharmacotherapy, but what you need to know is anticholinergics are the commonest medications which we use, and oxybutynin is one of the common agents we use. It is a non-selective anticholinergic, so it has got a lot of side effects in the form of dry mouth, constipation, hyperpyrexia, and cognitive disturbances. So we have more selective uh, agents like um, uh, tolteridin and solifenacin these days. We also have an agent called Mirabegron, which is a different, a totally different agent. It's a beta three agonist. It also helps to relax the, uh, the bladder. They are different method. And that is a, a, a med medication with, without the side effects of the anticholinergics. Now we have alpha blockers here to relax the urethral sphincter. And for external sphincter, we really don't use anything. And, but sometimes some people inject a Botox into external sphincter if it's this synergizer major problem. To promote emptying of the bladder, we hardly ever use any medication, but what we use is called a clean intermittent catheterization, also known as CAC in short. The parents uh, are initially taught to perform CAC, and later on the children can start a self-CAC. Urethral CAC is usually successful in children with a neurogenic bladder, as the urethra is not sensate in neurological conditions. It's particularly useful in boys where they can easily access the urethra. Uh, and if the urethral CAC becomes difficult or the patient is not able to do it, then you can go for a mitrofonov procedure, which is an appendicovasy costume. Female children need a special coaching for self-CAC because they cannot see the urethral opening. They have to feel for it. And they may either have to use a mirror and squat in the, um, over the mirror or use a selfie camera uh, to see the opening. And in wheelchair-bound children, it becomes even more difficult. So they are the ones who are likely to benefit from Mitrofenov procedure. So the, here is a little girl who has already undergone a Mitrofenov procedure, and she has also undergone a bladder augmentation uh, for a neurogenic bladder. And um, she is now performing a CAC via the umbilical uh, stoma, which is a Mitrofenov stoma. So uh, she is just washing her hands with soap and water. So it's a clean intermittent catheterization. She's using a seven French infant feeding tube. And this is a mother who is performing a CAC after washing her hands. Um, they keep it in a sterile container and they keep on changing the tube every day. And uh, so this is the uh, method of doing CAC, which has actually helped with these children in a big way. So in this patient, who is a 15 year old boy with the refractory uh, symptoms and then not able to tolerate anticholinergic medication, we are injecting Botox. So botulinum toxin is injected at around uh, 10 to 20 sites. Each site gets around uh, five to 10 units. And uh, we map the bladder into the superior wall, inferior wall, side wall, and everything. We just leave the trigone and then keep injecting both into the retrusor as well as in the submucosal plane to cause the relaxation of the bladder. 
the effect usually lasts for one to two years. The bowel management is an essential part of neurogenic bladder. If in a mild case, you can manage the laxatives or stimulants and dietary modifications. In more severe patients, we have to give a polyethylene glycol either in the form of a liquid or powder, and rectal washouts and enemas may be needed. And in more severe cases, you may have to perform an anti-grade continence enema or maze procedure where the appendix is brought out uh, as a stoma and the washout is given directly into the colon in an anti-grade fashion. Um, now, a word about neuromodulation. Uh, neuromodulation involves stimulating the peripheral somatic afferent nerves, the C fibers, and uh, in sacral neuromodulation, the pudendal afferent nerves are stimulated. In posterior tibial neuromodulation, the sensory component of tibial nerve is stimulated. So stimulation of the peripheral afferent nerve blocks the nerves, competing with the abnormal uh, visceral afferent signals from the bladder. So that, that way, the, both the sacral neuromodulation and posterior tibial neuromodulation cause a negative feedback and then help to uh, prevent the bladder contraction. So they prevent reflux bladder hyperactivity or retention. And um, this is a posterior tibial tense and this is a sacral tense. This is actually in our page, one of our patients. We've been performing this tense procedure for more of a functional problems than neurogenic problems because in those with the sacral agenesis or myelomeningosis, this doesn't work. But if the patient has got um, upper motor neuron problems um, due to higher cortical problems, then a tense may work. In those with the functional problems, uh, where there is no neurological, tense actually works. Uh, and um, we use a symmetric biphasic current at a frequency of 10 hertz and a pulse width of uh, 400 microseconds, which is applied for 20 minutes. The procedure is repeated on alternate days for uh, two to four weeks. So the types of neurogenic bladder and the surgical option depends on whether it is an overactive bladder or an overactive sphincter, where an augmentation and CAC may be needed. If it is an underactive bladder and overactive sphincter, you may have to simply do a CAC. If it is an overactive bladder and an underactive sphincter, then you again have to do an augmentation and CAC. Uh, and if it is an underactive bladder and an underactive sphincter, you may simply do a CAC if the capacity is good, but most often you end up doing an augmentation as well. So the, the idea is to enlarge the reservoir, tighten the sphincter, and enable a continent channel for CAC. So this is what we do during the surgery. Artificial sphincters are very rarely used. So this is an eight-year-old boy with a spina bifida with neurogenic bladder and a neurogenic detrusor overactivity and also a um, sphincter problem. His bladder neck was wide open. So we are using a rectus muscle sling here to tighten the bladder neck. So this is brought around uh, like a 360 degree swab and fixed to the opposite side of the uh, rectus. So that will cleave the sphincter grooves. And then once this is done, we increase the capacity of the bladder by using a bowel segment. We are using the appendix to create a mitrophonal appendix for basic ostomy, a continence catheterizable channel, and an ideal segment is isolated and used to enlarge the bladder after bivalving it. So that is the bladder being bivalved, and the intestinal segment will be opened up um, like a sheet, and then we can make it into U-shaped uh, fashion, like a pouch, and that will be used to make the bladder bigger. So the metrophon of stoma is usually fashioned at the umbilicus, so the patient can catheterize it. We should just ensure that it catheterizes easily before we complete the procedure. So that is the ileocystoplasty being performed. Now, as you know, ileum is not a native urothelium, so it is prone to complications like absorption of the urine and um, mucus-related mucus production, so mucus-related stones and urine infections and hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, but that is a trade-off uh, for increasing the bladder capacity. So long-term issues, uh, chronic kidney disease happens in, uh, risk is three times the general population, and the continence reduces in the third decade as these uh, patients stop CAC when they go to college. And um, UTA rates are around 20 to 30 percent. When you do DMSA scans, 25 percent of these patients have renal scars, and the same amount of patients end up in CKD also. Metabolic and growth issues are there in a 30 to 40 percent, 
particularly after bladder augmentation and uh, CKD. Um, erectile dysfunction is uh, noted in around 60 to 70 percent of these uh, patients when they grow up. Uh, however, one good point is they are easily manageable with the sildenafil. Now, issues relating to pregnancy, um, they may have 50 percent of them have normal delivery, 50 percent of them may, may need LSCS, and in those with the augmentation cystoplasty, uh, one has to be really careful not to open the uh, augment during an LSCS, which can be a challenge. Then secondary malignancies are particular problems following ileocystoplasty, and they may need the surveillance starting from third decade onwards every two to three years. Um, a word about uh, neurogenic bladder management in newborn period. Neurogenic bladder rarely causes hydroerythronephrosis or renal impairment in the newborn. So there are three approaches in the management of uh, this uh, neurogenic uh, problem in the newborn period. The first approach is image-based observation. So we do an ultrasound KEB and look for hydroerythronephrosis and post world residual volume. If they are there, then you go for uh, the protocol of neurogenic bladder. But if they are not there, you can actually um, watch them just doing an ultrasound. And this is my favored approach. The second approach is an early CAC newborn period. So in the UK, they favor this. Most children with the newborn, uh, in the newborn period, so the parents are taught to perform CAC. Their contention being the children become compliant to catheterization. The parents get used to the idea of catheterization. So that when they need a CEC later at the second or third uh, year of life, then you know that they are already trained for it. But the crates maneuver or expressing the bladder is, uh, is something which should be discouraged. Now, the third approach is urodynamic based selective treatment. This is what is followed in most centers in the United States where they do very early urodynamics. And then if the leak point pressure is more than 40, they go for uh, CAC and medication. Um, interestingly, around a third of the pay, newborns in, uh, have normal UDS. A third of newborn will have some abnormality, but not severe. And a third of them will have uh, very high pressures, uh, which probably warrant a intervention. But most of them, I feel, can be picked up if they are severe on ultrasound as well. Now, role of upper tract diversions, in infants with the severe hydroeurythronephrosis and urosepsis, they are too tiny to undergo a procedure like a bladder augmentation. So we may have to end up doing a urotrostomy or a vesicostomy. Usually a vesicostomy is done, uh, but urotrostomy also can be done on the reflexing side. Um, some other recent advances I want to mention, engineer the bladder tissue over a cellular or acellular scaffolds have been atten uh, attempted. The urothelium has advantages in reducing the metabolic side effects of IE augment. So if you put a urothelial um, lining onto the bladder, then it, uh, it can actually uh, help uh, to reduce the mucus or metabolic complications seen with IE cystoplasty. Now, some people say that urethrocystoplasty is an alternative if there is a one-sided non-functioning kidney. But in a patient with a neurogenic bladder, you invariably don't have enough increase in capacity with the urethrocystoplasty. Partial bladder dome transplantation has been performed in animal experiments, and the, the dome contracts along with the native bladder. So that is a reassuring um, information. Stem cell therapy is still experimental, has been tried in both the spinal cord as well as in the bladder to stimulate growth of normal um, neurological as well as muscular tissue. Um, then in uh, lumbar, the sacral nerve rerouting has been tried in China. Um, I really don't know how that works, but uh, the results are coming out now as we speak. Fetal surgery for myelomeningocele is one thing that has changed um, a lot of understanding of myelomeningocele management over the years. Uh, the MOMS study, management of myelomeningosis study, started as early as 2003. So we are nearly uh, 20 years uh, down the line. And the MOMS 1 results were found in 2015, where they said, where they initially thought prenatal surgery did not significantly reduce the need for CAC later, but was associated with the less bladder trabeculation. So less bladder trabeculation means less high pressure bladders, 
so less uh, renal failure less ekd uh, of course we won't know those in numbers yet uh, but basically the idea is to open the bladder open the uterus open the bladder open the spine expose the spine close the spinal cord in layers and then um, put the baby back into the uterus and close the baby so this is to prevent the injury from uh, exposure to uh, toxic amniotic fluid now mom's two trial results were available in the year 2021 just as late as last year and they got late outcomes in school children and they felt that it decreased the need for repetition these children had a better gait motor improvement uh, the only trade off being prematurity and maternal risk which were seen in some patients so fetal surgery still uh, has got some hopes the jury is still out whether it is going to be in the future so uh, follow your heart but take the brain with you maybe the blood are also with you and the folic acid should be given as an engagement gift uh, and it is too late to prescribe a baby shower because the bladder formation is complete by 6 to 7 weeks so if at all you have to give something it is even before the pregnancy is diagnosed so it better to give before they even they plan for pregnancy so i have recorded this uh, presentation in the youtube and if you are more interested in the subject you can buy this book on neurogenic bladder on amazon thank you for listening to this lecture